Welcome back to First Baptist Church. Today we're here with our pastor, Jeff, again, to do another question and answer. Um, so let's just jump right on into it. Now, I've heard it said to myself, and I know you've been called it a few times, many different ways, many different forms. Christians are racist, and that's it. What would you say to these people? Okay. We would need to go back to where our teachings come from, where our doctrines come from. Christ. Christ, yes. And we'd have to see what he says about it. Okay? The first thing is he says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So you have that little word, all, in there. And it encompasses everybody. Not just as a small group of people, but it encompasses the whole world. And then you have to also look at another story that Christ gives. But before we get to the story, you have to understand that there was, in the Jewish mind, the Jews, the Greeks, and then the very bottom of the barrel was the Samaritans. Because they were a mixture of the Jew and the Greek. So they, they were, as far as the Jewish culture was concerned, the very worst race you could possibly be. So Christ gives a story of a man who is hurt and has been robbed and left on the side of the road. And we have a priest come by. And the priest sees the man and he goes as far away from him as he can and goes down the road because he doesn't want to become unclean and so forth. A Levite from the priestly tribe comes by and sees the man and he goes as far away from the man as he possibly can because he doesn't want to deal with him or anything of that nature. So then you have a third person come by. You know who that third person was? A Samaritan. A Samaritan. The very lowest race as far as Israel was concerned. And this Samaritan went over, got the man, bound his wounds up, took him to the local inn, paid for his stay there, told the innkeeper, you know, uh, if it's more than this, let me know and I'll settle up with you when I come back through. But the whole story comes to this. So the Samaritan was the hero of the story. And what Christ is saying in that story is, among other things, is that even your lowest race that you think about is mine, belongs to me. And so Christ elevates uh, the man in that particular aspect of things. Then there's another verse that Christ uses, and, and he says this. It's John 3.16, and you've seen people holding up the signs for John 3.16, you know, when somebody's trying to kick a field goal. I don't know why they think that's going to distract them or anything, but they hold that sign up. And what does that verse say? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, there's a couple things in that verse that talk about race. First of all, all. God so loved the world. All the world. And he didn't say, I only love a certain group of people or a certain race of people or a certain economical class of people or, or, or things of that nature. You know, he said he loved the entire world. And he also says in that verse, for whosoever shall believe in him or trust in him has everlasting life. Well, the whosoever... It isn't limited to a race or a group of people. It's open to the entire world. So then we go to Paul. And Paul uh, writes, uh, for example, in, in Romans 1, 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation to all who believe. Not just to one group of people, but to everybody. Romans 10, 13, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's whosoever. It's not a particular group of people, but all people. Peter learned a lesson from God in the book of Acts. He's sent to go talk to a, a Roman guard. And he doesn't want to go see the centurion. He, he's all upset about it. And God reveals to him through uh, various visions that this man is important. To who? To God. So he calls 
him. He goes to this centurion. He shares the gospel of Christ with him. Paul later, writing in the book of Galatians, talks about how he is an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, the Jews, Jews, Gentiles, those two groups. So Paul is saying that he was called by God to share the gospel of Christ to the race outside of Israel. So when you look at what's all being said there, Christianity is not a racist religion. It is, a, it is open to everybody. It's open to any person of any race, background, or whatever in the entire world. And it's there showing the love of God to everybody. Now, I know I'm going to open a can of worms with this next question, but so be it. In Alabama or the Carolinas, over there, <coughs> there's a church that yes, puts on their sign. Yes, I know what they put on their sign, that... Uh, any black person who supports Trump is mentally deranged or something of that nature. You've already mentioned that Christians should not be racist. Yes. And, and we should not be picking and choosing who we share the gospel of Christ with. So what exactly does this sign do? Other than... Other than irritate me? Yeah. And paint us as crazy people. What does this sign do to the outside world that looks in on us? Okay, the first sign is, and I'm not sure if this is the first thing or the next thing is the first thing. <laughs> we'll go with this one. Okay. When he says black people, black, blacks, however he worded that sign, who support Trump are mentally deranged, he is alienating a whole group of people. Now, I don't know how many of them support Trump. I don't care. But what he is doing is he is alienating a group of people because he disagrees with somebody's political opinion. And he is trying to say that God is on my side and God belongs to me and if you don't agree with me, then there's something mentally wrong with you. you know, he's, he's way off base with that because the message of the church is not political and should never be political. Paul wrote, I came and, to, and I knew nothing but Christ and Him crucified. He wrote that to the church in Corinth. And the interesting thing is, that's where we should be. For some church to put up a political sign and to say that if you disagree with me politically, you're mentally deranged, is to alienate a whole group of people, whether it's whites, blacks, or you know whoever they are, uh, to say, you know, you don't like it, then something's wrong with you. I contend that pastor should be brought before the board of deacons and fired because he did not do what the message of the church is. He, he is hurting the church. He's hurting every church by putting up that sign. He is trying to, when he puts that sign up in, in the southeast, somebody who sees it on the news and sees we're of the same type of church looks at us and says, oh, those people don't like this particular group of people. And that's not true because that's not the message of Christ, that's not the message of the church. The church sign, the, the furthest off of the message of Christ it should be is, this is the time our services are. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's wrong. And it was wrong for him to do it. The second thing about it is, he took the time to put up a sign like that where is the love of God? It's not there. It's, no, it's not in that sign, is it? No. It's, it's just like that sign up in Eugene where it says, lust drags you to hell. Where is the love? Is, is that the most important message that the church has? Is to say, if you're this particular race and you support this particular man, then you're mentally deranged. Is that the most important thing that the church has to offer? No. What they have to offer is the love of God. And they have wasted God's time, they've wasted their time, they've wasted the message of the church and putting that up because people will see that and they won't see the love of God. They'll see something else. And to get off message like that is so wrong. And I don't care who the political person is, 
I don't care if it's Trump or if it's Obama or if it's Hillary Clinton or whoever it might be, to say if you support that and put that up on a sign outside of your church, you've left what the message is. Galatians says if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. And he repeats that right away. That's another gospel. That's not the message of the church. And someone to do that, a church to do that, is so wrong. We are here for one reason, and that's to share the gospel of Christ. And to put that up there just turns people off and makes people go, where's the love of God? It's not in that sign, and we are about the love of God, not about a political party or a political person. And the last thing I'd say about it is this. People need to get their hearts right with God. That pastor needs to get his heart right with God, and he needs to spend some time in prayer to say to God, what's happened? I need to restore the fellowship that he once had, because that's not the message of God either. No, it's not. No. Churches that put up these signs, they hurt us. Yes. They hurt our church, and they hurt people who are Christians. Now, there are people that are celebrities, that word that I can't get out, that are Christians. Yeah. And Drew Brees, now I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but yes, he, he, is. he is. He encouraged kids to take their Bibles to school. And he encouraged a couple other things. And he's receiving backlash for that. Yes. Okay, we're not about... Christianity is not about things like whatever their sign says. We're not about hate. We're not about racism. But these things that these other churches are doing are hurting people like Breeze, who's receiving backlash for these things. That He's trying to encourage kids to learn the love of God. Okay. First of all, I am not a New Orleans fan. No, but I like Drew Brees. <laughs> um, yeah, I do like Drew Brees. He's a good guy. Uh, yeah, he's a good guy. He is a Christian. Um, sorry, I root against his team so often. You're a Bills fan. It's okay. Uh, the Bills don't care about winning. New subject. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back to, back to Drew Brees and what he did. Okay, he went with focus on the family. Yes. Okay. Focus on the family and their mind is an anti-gay organization and therefore they're attacking Drew Brees for using Focus on the Family uh, and that's one of the things that Focus on the Family is doing is trying to get kids to bring their Bibles to school which is legal to do by the way. Mm -hmm. It's legal to pray in school as yes, well. It it's legal for students to have prayer in school. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, and we won't get into all that stuff because that's something totally different. But um, they are looking at something to just criticize him. And they're looking at something Focus on the Family stands for and saying anybody who identifies with Focus on the Family then must be anti-gay. Well, they, first of all, they misrepresent Focus on the Family. Secondly, Christianity is not anti-gay. And thirdly, all Drew Brees is saying is, let's bring our Bible to school. Okay. So what's wrong with that? Nothing. Um, what you have is an intolerance in the liberal left to anything that they disagree with. And since they disagree with Christianity, they will find anything they can to attack it. And, you know, it's just, part of, it's just part of life today. It's part of the American culture, and I regret that, but it is. Uh, so they're just going to simply attack him because he's a Christian. Okay. Be quiet. Shut up. Don't say anything. That's what they want from him. He's not going to do that. And I support him in what he's doing, even though I don't support his team. <laughs> He's a good guy. I do support him, but I'm with you. I don't always root for the saints. So, they'll do anything to keep Christianity quiet. 
basically. Including making it difficult for Christian-owned companies to come in and build their businesses and start their businesses and do things like that, like they're doing to Chick-fil-A, I believe. Yes. They're making it difficult for them to come in and difficult for them to open businesses. Okay. Why is it, there such an intolerance? Okay, and, and it's interesting you use the word intolerance, which is exactly correct. Let's, let's take the Chick-fil-A business, for example. Which, I, they taste good. I yeah. like Chick-fil-A. Okay. <laughs> If a person comes in and they are gay, is Chick-fil-A going to say, sorry, we can't sell you chicken? No. No. They will sell chicken to whoever comes in and lays down the money and says, I want whatever it is that, that they're selling. You know, they're in the business to make money. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you have then is because the owner of Chick-fil-A happens to say he endorses and supports traditional marriage which, by the way, is biblical marriage. And if you wanted to discuss that, in the book, we can. But uh, he says he supports that. So therefore, the intolerance from the left is, oh, if you support something we disagree with, we don't want to do business with you. We don't want your business to succeed. Well, they have the right to not go into a Chick-fil-A. They have a right to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken instead if that's what they want to do. But they're being intolerant when they try to keep Chick-fil-A from establishing another business. It's the same thing you have with the bakeries that refused to make a cake for gay couples because it was against their religious views. Uh, it's the same thing that you have uh, whenever they say that uh, we are anti-gay and they try to... to to hit us on, on that uh, particular aspect of things. No, it's because we have a particular view of what marriage is, and uh, they don't like it, so therefore they're becoming intolerant to it. We have a biblical view of marriage. Okay. Marriage, what is it? Go ahead. Marriage is a biblical principle. Yes. Okay. In, in my opinion, the state has no business in marriage because it's a biblical principle. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what the state says. The state has no business issuing marriage licenses. They didn't until they found out well, that they could get taxes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's all about money. It's all about money. But the state has no business issuing a marriage license. The county has no business issuing a marriage license. The state has no business saying who can and who cannot get married. Marriage is something from the Bible. It's God ordained, and God is the one who defined it. And therefore, it is a biblical principle. The state can never tell me what marriage is, because God's already defined it. Now, if two gay people want to go out and live together and go through some ceremony and stuff like that, that's between them and God. It's not between me and them. Uh, if they came here to get married, I have policies in place and I will give them the policies and, and, and all that and we'll go from that point. Um, and I'm not going to share what my policies are on this. <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that they were uh, vetted by attorneys and they're quite legal. Uh, but as you look at what marriage is, it's defined by God. The Supreme Court, the state, has no business defining marriage because they can't overrule God. Marriage is between one man, one woman. All this other stuff that they do is not biblical marriage. And that's where people have issues with Chick-fil-A and the owners of Chick-fil-A. Yeah, it's because the state's involved in marriage. Get the state out of marriage. Quit issuing marriage licenses. You know, quit doing all the things that the state is trying to do and it's all about money. Mm -hmm. And the problem takes care of itself as far as the legalities of things. But Chick-fil-A, myself, others will say marriage is between a man and a woman. 
Yes. Well, that's because that's what God says it is. Mm -hmm. And if they don't like that, well, they're not arguing with me. They're not arguing with the owner of Chick-fil-A, for example. Yeah, they're arguing with God. Let them take them up with them. Take God to court, so to and speak. And good luck. And good luck with that one. So, Christians aren't supposed to be racist. No, we're not. Christians are not homophobic. No. I, you know, I hate that word, but... <laughs> I know. I know you do. <coughs> Sorry. I hate that word because we don't fear homosexuals. God loves them, therefore we love them. God wants them to come to know him, therefore we want them to come to know him. God says, come unto me all ye labor heavy laden, therefore we want them to come to church. We want them to come to see Christ. We want them to see what God has for them. And it's not that I'm afraid of them. They have their views, I have mine. Mine are based in the Bible. I have no idea what theirs are based on. But we want them to come to know God. God loves them right as they are. As I said earlier, talking about race, say about homosexuality, say about whatever, whatever group of people might be out there, God loves them as they are. He wants them to come to know his son. He wants them to come to know him through his son. And it doesn't matter what group of people they are, what they may believe or what they don't believe, what their lifestyle is or isn't or anything of that nature. God wants them to come to get to know him. Therefore, I want them to come and I want them to come to get to know who God is. So I, I hate that term because <laughs> while I will say this, and this is not politically correct, You're but sin is correct. sin. Yes, it is. And uh, uh, homosexuality is a sin just the same as lying is a sin, just the same as any other aspect of life is a sin. And it's not that one's more sinful than another. They're all the same. The only difference is this. God says, come. Come, let me love you. Come as you are to come and to know my son. And I don't care who they are. That's the invitation. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to like and subscribe. See that's you guys all later. we have time for?